Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church on this last Sunday of May in 2024. We're very glad that you have joined us on this Memorial Day weekend, and we hope that you'll be blessed by your presence with us either in person or online. Traditionally, this last Sunday in May is a bit of a turning point in the Northern Hemisphere. Lots of folks are graduating from high school or from college. Some are planning weddings. Most are making plans for the summer. Where do we go? What do we do? What changes can we make to enjoy these months? But here in the United States, it's an important weekend, not just for looking forward, but also looking back on the sacrifice of those who gave their lives so that we can enjoy so much in this world today. The Hebrew Bible also tells stories of folks like that, folks who gave their lives for their country. Sometimes they succeeded, at other times they failed. But even in their failures, God was still at work. Even in their failures, God was planning something new to bring hope to them and us. This morning's Bible passage describes one of those times. It comes from the prophet Jeremiah, and I'll be saying much more about that in just a few moments. But at this point in the service, I invite you to join me and the worship of a God who is able to turn both our victories and defeats into blessings as we learn to follow Him. stand as you are able for the call to worship. Lord, you have our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, when you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom.
That was awesome. Uh, why don't you have a seat? I'll invite the children to come forward at this time as Adriana Krug has a word for them. And as they're coming forward, I'll ask the adults to pass the friendship pads found next to the center aisle. Good morning, good morning. That's awesome. I'm gonna Thanks. sneak right behind you, Jessica. Perfect. Good morning, Riley. This one. <laughs> All right, you guys, we have something very special happening this week. There's a special holiday that we get to celebrate. Does anyone know what that might be? What do you think? Yeah, Memorial Day is tomorrow, right? Now on Monday, that's when we're gonna celebrate Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. It is a day that we stop and we remember and we honor the military men and women who have died while fighting to defend our freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a really important holiday, right? So we enjoy a lot of freedom in our country. We're free to attend church and worship, right? We're free to choose what we would like to be when we grow up, what job you might want to have. We're free to choose where we want to live, and really, we're free to choose a lot of the things that affect our daily lives. But that freedom, it wasn't free, right? There were lots of courageous men and women, some of them are even in this room with us this morning, who gave their time and were able to risk, willing to risk their lives to defend that freedom. Some of them lost their lives mm -hmm. to defend that freedom. And those are the people that we remember and we honor tomorrow. Now, just like there were many brave women and men who risked their lives for our freedom and sacrificed their lives for our freedom here on earth, Jesus sacrificed his life for our freedom as well. Mm -hmm. And really, the greatest freedom that we have is the freedom that we have in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the Bible teaches us that the penalty for sin is death. But Jesus set us free from that penalty. We were set free because he paid the price for us, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of death, we were given eternal life. That's pretty special. That's a pretty big deal. So that freedom wasn't free either because Jesus paid that price. So this week, while we celebrate Memorial Day, let us remember to stop and thank God for those who've paid the price for our freedom. Let us remember to thank God for Jesus who set us free from the penalty for sin because he was willing to pay the price for us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. We're thankful for those who paid the price for that freedom, but more importantly, we thank you for the freedom we have because Jesus was willing to pay the price for our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's head to Sunday school. One of the most powerful elements of worship in the Presbyterian Church is the unison prayer of confession. As a community of faith, we confess our sins, our shortcomings, and inability to fulfill our spiritual commitment to the Lord and others. Please stand if you are able and join me for the prayer of confession. Gracious and holy God, you have showered us with blessings the beauty of nature, the provision for physical needs, and the gospel of redemption in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are a part of that gospel. You have a dream for us, but our own dreams do not always align with yours. Forgive us for those times when ego was unchecked and dreaming did more harm than good. And forgive us for those times when you know us so wounded that we did not dare to dream. Then, Lord, in your mercy, take our dreams and shake them into the sunny gift created by your Spirit, furnished by your Church, and chiseled by your Holy Word. Amen. Who shall separate us from the Lord's love? Shall trouble or hardship, pain or suffering, in all things we can be conquerors through him who loves us. Neither death nor life, angels nor demons, 
the past nor future, nor anything else in all creation, can separate us from God's compassion and his forgiveness. God's love endures forever through his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Having been assured now of God's forgiveness and the presence of his spirit, I invite you to extend some sign of God's grace and blessing to those around you. may be seated. Now is the time in our service when we share some of the blessings that God gives us by sharing also news of our church family. Uh, first, next Sunday, June 2nd, is Teacher Appreciation Sunday, when we will recognize, yes, those who have blessed us and our children in so many ways. During the last nine months, we'll do that in worship here. Then at 4 p.m. next Sunday, return here to the grounds for the annual church picnic. As in years past, we'll have great games, food, and time for fellowship. Unlike in years past, we'll also have table games. For those who are a little bit awkward in potato sack races. Uh, so there will be fun for all. Cost is just four bucks per person, children still free, but your last chance to sign up was on the patio after church today, so I hope you'll do that. Two weeks from today will be another important milestone, a called congregational meeting, during which we'll ask you to formally ratify a five-year mortgage extension negotiated by church leaders that will save us several thousand dollars every month. This will help us end our mortgage in about 11 years, 
without bankrupting us in the meantime. So we will be very pleased to present those terms to you next two weeks from today. Three weeks from today will be Father's Day, when both dads and surrogate dads who have blessed us and our kids will be recognized. We did much the same thing for moms two weeks ago, but we don't want any of you who enjoy spending time with children to feel left out, and that's why you can volunteer to substitute in Sunday school this summer, giving our regular teachers a break. And even if you can't see yourself as a teacher in any way, you can volunteer to help with vacation Bible school. You can help with recreation. You can help with registration. You can help with snacks. And if you're willing to be part of that, it really is lots of fun. Just let Jennifer Nena know. That'll be the third week of July this year. Moving on to prayer concerns. Um, First, I'm very sorry to report that Gloria Davis took a nasty fall yesterday, broke her hip. She's in surgery as I speak at Temecula Valley Hospital. I'm also sorry to report that Joe Heidman had a bad fall this week, reopening a surgical scar from the past. She's also at Temecula Valley Hospital. Um, third, I'm sure you want to remember all those who've lost family members or friends in the armed services of this country. That's such an important weekend to honor them. Fourth, I hope you remember the families of Faye Compton and Helen Burroughs, both of whom passed away in the last few weeks. We have contact information for both families in the office if you'd like to write to them. On the positive side of the ledger, I'm very happy to report that Don Mann is recuperating at Atria following his release from the hospital, while John, Meckett, John Beckett and Bob Moore are now recuperating at home. All of them still need prayers for significant medical issues, but we're glad they're dwelling in the comfort of their homes. And finally, Tom Mulder asked us to remember Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, two astronauts who should be launched on Boeing's Starliner next weekend, Tom's team has worked for years to make that journey safe. And so we need to pray for all of them. And with those thoughts in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we are so grateful for your presence with us and our triumphs and our tragedies, our laughter and our tears. You stick with us. You promised you would. Lo, I am with you always. Encouraged by the power of that promise, we intercede today for all those who were mentioned from the pulpit or listed in the bulletin. We pray for their safety. We pray for their healing. We pray that they might see several signs of grace within the days to come. We also pray quite specifically for those whose names now come to mind. Thinking beyond that circle of family and friends, we intercede for all throughout the world who face danger of some sort especially on this weekend for those serving in the armed forces of the United States. We pray that you deliver them from evil in all its many forms, and that you use them to protect the values all of us hold dear, peace, freedom, justice, self-determination, opportunity for all. Finally, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work deeply within us throughout the months to come, remembering those in Arlington and all military cemeteries. Make us worthy of the sacrifice that they bore for us. We do ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to join me in the prayer our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Chancel Choir, for bringing us Keith Christopher's arrangement of a classic choir anthem originally written by Jill Jackson Miller. Jill began life as a radio TV actress, but her greatest work turned out to be music, especially music that springs from tragedy. Regarding this anthem, Jill said she was actually suicidal for a time following the end of her marriage to a screenwriter. But then she discovered the peace and hope of God revealed in Jesus Christ, a peace that she wrote into that anthem. This morning's Bible text also springs out of a very painful ending, the end of ancient Israel as they knew it. Not only were these ancient Jews defeated by the greatest emperor of that era, they were also deported to serve his purposes in Babylon. Some promised them that their captivity would be short, that the land of Israel would be restored to greatness soon. But in this morning's text, the prophet Jeremiah brings a different sort of message. Yes, God was still active. Yes, God would still move, but in a different way than they expected at the time. They would not be going back, at least not anytime soon, but they would be going forward with God's mercy and God's grace. His letter comes to us from the 29th chapter of the prophet, beginning with verse 1, so I invite you to listen now for the Word of God to you. 
From Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have deported from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear, bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Three things are central here. First, their unpleasant circumstance is God's will, not just the emperor's will. He writes to those whom I deported to Babylon. Second, it is God's will that they remain there. Don't daydream of your homelands. Don't get caught up in a coup. Don't think this will be short. It won't. Third, don't just remain thrive. Build houses, plant gardens, take spouses, bear children, multiply, don't decrease. And that's not all. Mm -hmm. Then seek the welfare of the city where I have deported you, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your own. This verse is pretty amazing in context. Seek the welfare of the city you do not want to be in, the welfare of the people who drug you from your homeland, the welfare of the people who took your property away, pray to the Lord for them. Wouldn't it be more natural to pray for their defeat, to pray for hard times, chances to escape? Wouldn't it be more natural to rebel? Absolutely. And yet, so often in the Scripture, God gives this type of word to people in duress. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And that's why Paul says, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For then you will pour burning coals on his head. In other words, he'll feel so guilty that his behavior is forced to change. It doesn't always happen, I must admit. But when it does happen. It's amazing. The results are so dramatic in God's eyes that really is the number one plan for change. But it's not an easy plan for them or anyone else. You might call it killing with kindness. But perhaps a better phrase I'd suggest is amazing grace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when the mouth of Babylon is stuffed for 70 years will I visit you and fulfill my promise to bring you back to this place. This verse explains the problem with false prophets. They give false hope. They're the ones who said, any day it's going to get better when it wouldn't. Even though they wanted to hear that so badly. But of course, Jeremiah doesn't really pump up Babylon either. He doesn't describe it as a wonderful place. In this morning's text, it's almost like it's some sort of cancer, some sort of animal, only when the mouth of Babylon is filled for 70 years where all these things happen, only when it's getting fatter, more arrogant, more indolent, more proud. Modern parallel might be symbolized with this character. Any Star Wars fans here? <laughs> he loved to devour victims, and he took quite a few in. But in this morning's Bible story, the Jews could not defeat him. It would take another hero from the East. The key, pass, per, the key message, though, in all of this is keep on going. God has a purpose. God has a plan. Even in the lair of Jabba the Hutt or the tenements of Babylon, these exiles would not be consumed nor destroyed. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future with hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, 
and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you search with all your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like you to imagine, if you will, that you were among the exiles in Babylon. You've been cut off from your homeland for years. You long to go back. Some folks are encouraging you that we can beat them, we can knock them out, we can make things change, but they're wrong. And one man says that, plainly, boldly, clearly, that's not the way, don't beat them, bless them. Pray to God on their behalf. But what'd you say to him? A lot of folks would say, kiss off, or something worse. But when the coup attempt failed, again, they had to listen. They had to think, you know, perhaps he really is right. Perhaps Babylon is God's will, after all. And our job is to make the best of it. But how do you do that? What does that mean in their world and in ours? Well, first, I think it's important to recognize that this message tells us that if you are one of God's people, then God is in charge of your future, like it or not. That's why I've always liked this little comic that I saw saw several years ago. The top line describes our plans. Smooth paths, small hills, quick victories, hooray! The bottom line describes God's plans. Pits, clouds, rocks, boulders, storms, a route much harder to traverse. Of course, it's also a much greater victory in the end, but it doesn't make it easier. Several parts of the Bible describe just that sort of journey. 40 years in the wilderness, 70 years of subjugation, 50 years of exile in Babylon, we take the Bible story seriously, it's obvious that God's plans are very different from our own. But it's also obvious that there is good reason for it. Because God doesn't want to just build your ego. God wants to build your character. God wants to build your legacy. God wants to make your life into a blessing for everyone to see. It typically requires a few boulders along the way. And that's why the Apostle Paul can say all things work together for good. Not all things are easy. Not all things are lovely. Not all things are painless. But all things have a purpose. God uses them. God's plan is to make all that turn for good. In other words, God's in charge. Whether you like it or not. But you still have a role to play. You really do. Because God invites you to cooperate with his plans. That's why this passage tells us, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives for your sons, daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply, do not decrease. In other words, bloom where you're planted. God doesn't want you to just endure this time of life. God wants you to thrive in it, even if you're not exactly where you want to be. I've talked to so many veterans through the years and active duty soldiers who learned to do that. Many grew up in small towns surrounded by family and friends, and thanks to the U.S. Army or Marines or Air Force, they're suddenly ripped away from all that to different cities, different towns, different parts of the world. They have to learn to trust those whom they've never met before and accomplish very hard objectives that they've never tried before. They had to adapt quite quickly to unpredictable environments, and so did their families. Some of the spouses of those veterans were just amazing to me, just jumping in wherever they were, joining churches, joining clubs, planting gardens, raising kids, learning to find joy wherever they may be. I've known so many in the churches that I served, and every single one of them was a blessing in some way, because they learned through the grace of God, the guidance of this text, the determination to connect, 
There is a way to thrive wherever you may be. But you have to cooperate with God's plans. I guess the big question is how to do that. How do you take that crucial step? I'd say two things are involved. First is just seek God. Seek God. If you seek me, you will find me. If you search with all your heart. Those who heard these words typically had sought God in public worship for years, but that wasn't possible in Babylon. So they had to worship personally and privately. And so do we. When life's hard, really hard, Sunday morning's not enough. When you're not where you want to be, when you're not how you want to be, when you feel cut off from some part of your future or your past, Sunday's great, but not enough. You need to seek God daily. You need to seek God personally. And the promise of this text is that God will answer. If you seek me, you will find me. Not maybe, not sometimes. You will. You search with all your heart. You got to hold on to that. Life is really tough. So that's the first step, is to seek the Lord. The second step, interestingly enough, is seek the welfare of those around you. Even if they are not Christians, even if they're not nice people, even if they are a bit arrogant, even if they are immoral in some ways, seek their welfare, not just your own. The biggest challenge of this text, and yet also one of the biggest blessings when you learn to do it well. I was reminded of that recently after reading a book called Esperanza Rising by Pam Munoz Ryan. It's based roughly on the life of her grandma. Pam's grandma was Esperanza Ortega. Esperanza means hope. She had lots of reasons for hope as a child, the pampered child of a wealthy landowner named Sixto Ortega. They had a large ranch. She played with horses. She especially played with her beloved grandmother, Abuelita. But on the day before his 13th birthday, her dad gets murdered on his way to town. And a few months after that, the ranch is burned by vandals. So she has to flee. She knows she has to flee. Her whole family does, with a few servants eventually arriving at a camp for immigrants in Arvin, California. There they reside in small quarters with that servant's family and the family of his brother. Every adult has to work out in the field, back-breaking work all day long. Esperanza's too young for that, but she learns to work at home, raising younger children, sweeping floors, scrubbing, all those things she never did as a kid, as a teen. She's learning to grow up hard and grow up fast. But the big thing she longs for most is her beloved Abuelita, who had to stay in Mexico. She wants Grandma to come back again. Life gets even harder when a dust storm sweeps their village, making her mother very sick. Now the money... Esperanza had saved to bring Grandma back to the States must be used to make Mom well. And even though Mom recovers, life is bitter, life is hard, so hard, that Esperanza tells her lifelong friend Miguel, the youngest son in that servant family, that there really is nothing worth it here in the States. He argues with her, but she says, you're still a peasant the son of our old servant, you've got nothing more to tell. After which he decides to leave the camp. Now Esperanza's feeling even more hopeless, both guilty and alone. She doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know where to go. She's really just desperate for months at a time. But then when she's completely tempted to give up, Miguel shows up again with Abuelita, with Grandma. He went all the way to Mexico, risked his own life to bring her here. And Esperanza is just thrilled. She can't believe it. 
In this story, I think Miguel serves much the same role as Jeremiah in this morning's text. And at first, his family brings bad news. You've got to flee. You've got to get out of Mexico. There's no safe place here. But later, he brings good news. Life can get better. You can be reunited. God has a purpose in it. If you keep working hard, it will improve. Much like this Bible passage we read today, the story reminds us that life can be painful in many ways. Those of you who have been exiles or refugees know that well. But those who know our God don't start, stop with that part of the story. They read the bigger story of God's purpose and God's plan. Eventually, they learn from experience that this morning's text is true. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future with hope. you got to hang on to that. You absolutely do. And you will see that the God we serve will make it true in your life as well. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good news of the gospel. Wherever you go, God goes with you. Wherever you are, God is already there. The same God who dwells in you has something he wants to do through you where you are. So go forth with God's blessings to bless the lives of others, remembering that Christ walks with you. Mm -hmm.